I was like, uh, well, look, I'll never have to play a Scottish person. And then, of course, the script that you read that I was just obsessed with required a Scottish accent. And it's weird just when you're motivated, like when there is an actual like pressure put on me. It's like you've got to if you want to play this part, you've got to be able to do this. Hey there, welcome to The Awardist on Entertainment Weekly. I'm Dave Carger. Very happy to be here with Paul Meskel from the beautiful and very intriguing film After Sun. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. The writer-director Charlotte Wells did such a beautiful job in this film. It's a very different kind of film. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know how you were introduced to her and this film. Did you have a conversation with her first or did you read the script first? What was the order of things? It, it was the latter. It was a script first. I distinctly remember getting it from my agents on, late on a kind of Friday, reading it on the Friday and quickly messaging them back and being like, can we set up a meeting with Charlotte? On Because it was the kind of script that you read and you're like, I feel like everybody who reads this script is going to want to be in it. So trying to like push the push that as, as much as I could, and then I read it a couple more times. I think I read it twice more that weekend, and um, watched her short films, Laps and Blue Christmas and uh, Tuesday, which I was just blown away by. So yeah, it was pretty traditional. It was like read the script, then have the, I had the meeting with Charlotte. It's such a different kind of film visually. How, if at all, was that explained? in the written script? It's pretty much all there. It's it's like, it's interesting, I've got that question a couple of times in terms of is it a pretty spare script? And it's 96 pages, 97 pages. Um, and I think there isn't a huge amount of dialogue in the film, but there is pretty, ex in moments, pretty extensive stage directions, mm -hmm. which I think were a big um, reason for me wanting to do the film, was seeing how much detail Charlotte had put into those kind of non-verbal moments, especially with Callum, especially towards the end of, end of the film where you're, an audience is leaning in towards him a little bit more. Mm. I just thought we're so beautifully observed in her writing of him, yeah. Were there any films from the past that Charlotte wanted you to watch before you filmed this? Because I know she was influenced by lots of other different filmmakers. Yeah, I we, we didn't discuss that actually in, because um, I think Charlotte was very keen for the tone to be her, like she was in charge of that. But it was my job to kind of, um, or to, to be very present with Callum, and for Callum to feel, feel very present tense and not to feel like a memory piece. Mm. So I like watched some of the films that like, like somewhere and, and things like that, which I'd seen before. So it was just the perfect excuse to go back and watch them again. Mm. But- um, Sofia Coppola. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. that's a great choice. Yeah, and Tomboy and, um, films like that, a lot of Lynn Ramsey's early work. Why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Dad, you know, they're like kids. Why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Mm. Sophie, they're like old. It's surprising because you're so young to see you playing a dad. <laughs> Have you ever played a dad before no. in any medium? Actually, is that I played a 55-year-old man in uh, my first ever play at drama school. Really? To great success. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was uh, like the benefit of drama school. You get to play all these amazing characters, but this is my first uh, kind of age-appropriate dad, I would say. And Relatively, having, yeah. And having a child opposite you. Totally, yeah, absolutely. What was that? First of all, Frankie Corio, who plays Sophie, your daughter, she's great. Yeah. Uh, what was the process with her? Did you meet her before she was cast? Was she like a finalist and you met with her or did she just get the part and then you met her? She was, uh, uh, Charlotte was keen to cast Sophie first. So Frankie was cast and I was brought in, I think with, one or two other boys. And I remember reading with Frank and I was like, you're a genius. And you don't even know you're a genius yet. Or maybe she does. I have a sneaky suspicion that Frankie knows that she's exceptionally talented. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we did uh, some improv games. You know, I just had a good feeling from the way that the interaction went, that I was like, I think it might go our way. And it did. Which I'm, delighted about. That's fascinating. So she had the part yeah. and there were a couple of you that were angling for Callum. For Callum so yeah. did she tell you afterwards that you did better than everybody else? Yeah, she actually told me who I was up against. And I think, <gasps> I'll never say who, who, who it was, but uh, I think she was, uh, she, she, was key, she was keen to tell me that it was somebody that she'd seen on the telly and she hadn't seen normal people, um, which I'm grateful 
before, but uh, yeah, it was somebody else. So I'm was. not asking you to tell me who it was, but when you found out who it was, were you like, good on you? I was like, that guy's a really, really good actor, so I'm really happy that it went my <laughs> way. Yeah. The movie is so interesting in its tone and in its feel. It feels very loose mm -hmm. when you're watching it. it. It just has an ease to it. It also has something of what I would describe as like a voyeuristic quality that in some ways we're almost, as an audience, seeing what we're not meant to be seeing. We're seeing yeah. these very private moments. How did that influence how it felt on the set? Did it have a loose feel? Did it have a voyeuristic feel in the making of it? The, the making of it is like, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but it, the, the, the feeling of making was very different to like the, especially with, with Frankie, because we only had her in front of camera for four hours a day. So there was a kind of kinetic energy to that, which I think was really useful because mm -hmm. you just embrace the energy that Frankie brings. There was a very distinct energy shift when I got to be by myself with Charlotte because we just had more, we had lots of time to film a lot, a lot of those kind of um, isolated column fragments. So there was two kind of, there was like A and B energy that were very, very different. Mm. Yeah. How do you get in the mindset of being a dad when you're not one? My in to the character wasn't that he was a dad because I, I would have found, I, I think I would have been general in my choices because mm. I don't I don't have that. Of course, I can imagine what it would be like. I, I'm my father's son and, and all of that. But I think my in was in the two weeks in the lead up, myself and Frankie got to hang out before we were filming for two weeks in Turkey. And it was about kind of becoming friends with mm. Frankie and, and Sophie, because I think that's actually what that relationship is. It's not a standard father, daughter no. relationship. I think they're friends first and foremost. And of course, there's like he's a disciplinarian when he wants to be and when he's nervous about certain corners of the world that he doesn't really want her to venture. But then there's other moments when he's like, I've taken all the drugs in the world and you can too, just promise me that you'll tell me. So I think there's loads of, you're basically seeing a young man navigating being a father and I was able to access the young man a little bit easier than I was the father and I just hoped that the love that I felt for Frankie would translate into something that felt authentic and I do think it feels authentic. It feels so real. <laughs> yeah, and you and you get the sense, and I'm trying to remember quite frankly if this is explicitly spelled out in the film, but you definitely get the sense that he's not the primary parent. No, they're yeah. They're on this holiday together. Yeah. It's a short time that he has with Absolutely, her. Absolutely, yeah. Can you tell me what kind of notes Charlotte Wells gave you that were helpful in the filming? After I'd been cast, it was about two two or three months in leading into the film, and myself and Charlotte would speak on the phone once mm -hmm. or twice a week. Just kind of long form conversation. N notes would only really come in if there was something that she didn't really, f if, if there was like a little, pu a gentle push in a direction that she wanted to go, but it wasn't heavily noted. Charlotte has a wonder wonderful way of like kind of collaborating really quietly with her actors. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel like it's, um, nothing feels broad in her films, mm -hmm. which, or in, her, in this film, yeah. I know that you've been praised for some of the accent work that you've done on stage. How difficult is it for an Irishman to do a Scottish accent? It was one of those that in drama school I couldn't do. I was like, uh, well, look, I'll never have to play a Scottish person. And then of course, the script that you read that I was just obsessed with required a Scottish accent. And it's weird, just when you're motivated, like when there was an actual like pressure put on me, it was like, you've got to, if you want to play this part, you've got to be able to do this. It was the first time that I've actually stayed in accent throughout a shoot, which oh, I, really? I, I really enjoyed. I kind of feel nervous about stuff like that because you, you, you hear of actors doing it and sometimes I cringe, and like, which isn't a reflection on them. It's kind of something that I've always been like, Ugh, about. Whereas actually the, in, in the doing of it, I really enjoyed the kind of liberation of that. Yeah. Do you ever move back to Scotland? No. Why? There's this feeling once you leave where you're from that you don't totally belong there again. You okay through there? Don't you ever feel like tired and down and feels like your bones don't work, like you're sinking? Hmm. We're here to have a good time, eh? The movie is really interesting because it doesn't spell everything out, right? Mm -hmm. We're learning about Callum and we're thinking as an audience, is he depressed, is he alcoholic? Yeah. We never find out. 
Did you have answers in your mind as to what he was going through? Yeah, I, I, th I th those were the kind of conversations that I would have had with Charlotte in the lead up to it. And then I think a couple of weeks out from filming, I think it was important for us to kind of loosely, we had an idea that there was probably some severe depression going on there or a version of that. But then the closer we got to filming, the less keen I was to diagnose him because I think the point to me that I find so tragic about the film is that he doesn't know what's happening to him. Conversely, if you're, the, if you're then kind of prescribing a kind of set of feelings or emotions onto him, I think it can become quite like clear cut. And I think what is so upsetting to him and what kind of generates that sense of feeling of anxiety and panic is that there's something going on in his brain and his body that is bigger than he can tolerate. That was, uh, that was a, a discovery I think that we both made getting close to filming, which I thought was really useful actually. At the end of the movie, as an audience member, you think to yourself, do these two ever see each other again? Mm -hmm. I think they don't. You don't have to tell me what you think, but do you have an answer in your head? What I do. do? Yeah, I, I do, but it depends on which perspective you're looking at it from, I think. that's Meaning what? Meaning whether it's the young Sophie or the adult Sophie's perspective that you're talking about. Or maybe both, but, but I um, what I love about the film is the amount of people who come out with the same feeling but very different responses to that question, mm. I think is um, the mark of a filmmaker who's really confident and doesn't feel the need to explain to an audience, but it still feels confident that the feeling is going to land with them. Absolutely. What has Frankie's response been to the acclaim of this film? I think she's having a ball, yeah, as I would, if as I am. I think she's incredibly pr proud, I think. We've got to go to the most kind of amazing parts of the world together promoting a film that we made and nobody knew we were making it. We announced it like a month before Cannes. Wow. So it all kind of has happened. There was no anticipation for the film. It premiered at Cannes and then it built its audience and kind of um, hearsay about the film since then. So it's, it has been a full on experience for me and her, I think. You know, I want you to know that you can talk to me about anything as you get older, you know? I've done it all and you can too. <laughs> Wish we could have stayed for longer. Me too. How would you say making this film changed you as an artist and as a person? I'll, I'll probably have a way better answer for you in about three years time because <laughs> it okay. takes time to percolate. But I think it is it, it has forced me or asked me to remember uh, my relationship with my own parents from when I was 10 and 11 and 12. Mm in a way that I haven't ever thought about. And kind of how demanding it is on parents when you suddenly, when you're a child, you look up to these, they're icons, that they are your, the people who teach you everything. Yeah. But you, they, I, what I think this film does is it shows you that your parents don't always have the answers, but they're expected to have them. Mm. Um, but I can come back to me in three years and I'll have a more eloquent answer hopefully. I'm gonna hold you to that. Great. <laughs> uh, Paul Meskel, you did a great job in this movie. Congratulations. Movie's Thanks. called After Sun. Check it out. Thanks so much for watching.